Welcome to Theology Thursday, a weekly podcast dedicated to cultivating theological conversation amongst millennials. I'm your host, Ryan Mock. I'm your co-host, Connor Grubbs. And I'm Johnny. Yeah, he, he doesn't really know what he is. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm going to be totally honest. We brought Johnny on as a guest last week uh, to talk about a few things. And then me and Ryan agreed, because of how horrible it went, to never have him on the show again. But he's just kind of been following us around ever yeah. since. Yeah, so I'm have to follow restraining order. He's still here. Um, no, actually, in all seriousness, we had a great time last week. It went super well. Um, and we decided we'd keep him around for a little bit. So, Johnny, uh, welcome officially to the Theology Thursday family. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. You're a, you're a, a co-co-host. Sure. Okay, you're, I mean, you're at the bottom of the totem pole, but you're still here. That's yeah, fine. maybe one day you yeah. get a, I mean, you, you work went, your way up. You look, know. I mean, in just one week, you went from guest to cocoa host. Yeah. No, I feel like I've arrived, actually. Yeah. There's nothing more I need to do. Yeah, you have. Um, in fact, I think we're going to double your pay. Yeah. Zero dollars. Zero times zero. Zero. I'm sorry, I just had to zero. explain that to everybody. That would actually be zero times two, which is also zero. Oh, I said that wrong. Double, <laughs> yeah, doubling someone, no. Okay. Well... Uh, Ryan's not allowed to handle any of the financial aspects of this. <laughs> Good thing we don't have any. <laughs> not yet. Mm-hmm. 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 Hint, hint. Um, so, um, me and Ryan went to visit uh, this uh, outreach that's in the process of becoming a church uh, called House of Hope, St. Yes. Pete. And we went to visit it this past weekend. Which was the the Saturday right before Easter. Yeah, Easter Eve. It was their Easter Eve service. And, uh, well, I mean, it started off pretty bad because I, what I did was I went on the Facebook page and I hit the address. And it took us to a house in the exact opposite direction of where House of Hope actually is. Yeah. And, and so, like, we got there when... We got to the wrong location when it was supposed to start. And they start off by serving dinner it was at 6 30 i believe yeah and then we're like all right what next <laughs> yeah like we're like at this point we're gonna be so late we almost just gave up and went to see god's not dead three. Oh god help us <laughs> um but then you know i got a text from the person who had invited me and saying oh well it's okay we eat till like 7 15 we got time um, and that we weren't the only people who had been misdirected by Facebook, right. which Luckily, they've updated Yeah, now. they did fix their Facebook. So if you were like, hey, I want to check out House of Hope, you can use the address on Facebook. That's okay. But since me and Ryan were, uh, were like, hey, let's, let's go, but we were running late, we were like, oh, we probably won't have time to eat there, so let's go ahead and get food on the way, just like the first drive through yeah. And Ryan, what was the first drive through we saw? Well, right, and we didn't know what was on the way, so we're like, yeah, first yeah. first one. The first one that we got to was Checkers. Now, <laughs> if you know anything about Checkers, they serve hamburgers and hot dogs. For, for some reason, when I said Checkers, Ryan's immediate thing was, oh, yeah, hot dogs. Yeah, well, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of in the hot dog mood. Yeah. So I'm like, let's have hot dogs. And so we, we, we pull into the checkers, and first off, there's two lanes you could go down. You go down the right lane, and the checkers building will be on your left side. If you go down the left lane, then the checkers will be on your right side. That is mind-blowing. And so, yeah, honestly, it's revolutionary. <laughs> and so I, we, I went, we went down the left lane, and we're like, all right, focus on the checkers building. And I was focusing, my eyes were set on that checkers building, and I went right past the menu. Because the menu was actually on the left side. Yeah, not only the menu, but the person who takes the order. You just drove right past them <laughs> to the window. <laughs> they're I saw her. standing there with the headset. Well, I and just... there was a menu, and you drove right past both of them, and we're just there, and the lady's like kind of looking at us. We're like, did you order your food? And I'm like, I'm so embarrassed right her now. Self-esteem because, just because, because since we went through the left lane, I'm the one facing the person at the window. And I'm like, look, <laughs> I'm sorry about my friend. <laughs> He's special. She thought we were morons. <laughs> she, no, look, look I... I like to think she thought you were more. I mean, you were the one driving. It was hey, not you my didn't, fault. you didn't stop me, though. I can't stop. I'm not going to. You're driving. Don't put this on me. Hey, you didn't say, like, as I pull up, you, you didn't say, like, hey, just remember, 
the menus on a left side. So just be aware of that. No, you because never because it's a giant it. menu. How could you miss it? Obviously, it's not giant enough. Okay. I anyway, it. I freeze up, and since I'm the one right there, I'm like, uh, I want a hot dog. <laughs> because, and I didn't really want a hot dog because we're, in, we're we're riding in the car. But Ryan said hot dog, so that was just on my mind. <laughs> and then she says, Well, do you want chili on it? And I'm just like, Ah, uh, sure. I wasn't really thinking about. It. I was just so nervous that it was so awkward and tense. So I said. So I ended up getting a chili cheese dog. Okay. Ryan gets the same thing. Yeah, I'm like, you know what? I love chili dogs. This, I love them. This story is starting with chili dogs, and I don't really want to know where it ends. <laughs> <laughs> so we got our chili dogs. Yeah. And then... Which, needless to say, when you're driving somewhere is a horrible yeah, idea. I'm not really sure why we thought, you know... It, it she gave just... us, like, three napkins. Oh, yeah. She only provided three napkins. <laughs> and no fork or anything like that. No. And when... So you get the hot dog in a carton, like, shaped like a hot dog. But when they put the chili on, they overflowed the carton yeah, with I, chili. I literally drank the chili out of it. Yeah. And... <laughs> this is gross. Keep in mind, I'm driving... It was really good. <laughs> I'm driving, and I'm attempting to eat this chili dog. And I'm getting chili all over <laughs> yeah, my pants. Attempting is the key word. Right before we go to the House of Hope, where I'm a new person, <laughs> nobody knows who I am, and that's the first impression yeah. everybody's gonna and have of me. That's the key with the chili, chili all over, over his crotch. Yeah, yeah. It right. was not a very proud moment. No. And so ultimately, I'm like Connor. I really can't do this. This is not. Well, I figured possible. it out. I you did, but you weren't driving anything. I know. I'm just saying. Like I was. So yeah, we switched. Yeah, and, um, and he didn't get any chili on him at all. No, I walked into that. Place I was I was crossing camp. my fingers. I was hoping that he'd get chili on him, so I'm not alone. But alas, you were. I was you should have tossed yeah. some on him. You should have like <laughs> yes. sprinkled a little bit. And, but yeah. it was good chili, so you don't want to waste any of it. That's well, yeah, that's true. It was good, wasn't it? Yes, it was good. Awesome. <laughs> I'm really confused. This is um, a great story. I, I actually, I had, I had to switch chairs. I had to move to the passenger seat because I needed to finish this chili dog without getting chili all over my shorts. So, like Connor, take the wheel. Connor, take the wheel. And that's what he did. And we did I not did. die on the way up there. And I finished I my chili dog. And even in the passenger seat, I spilled chili all over my shorts. That is true, yeah. You're not very good at eating a chili dog without utensils. No. Well, I, but I am. Well, while I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. But you even just admitted you still did it while you were in the passenger seat. I think that's oh. my point. Oh, that's true. So, Johnny, when did you do this weekend? <laughs> uh, this weekend, we had the sunrise service at our church. Ooh. We had 550 Ooh. people. Yeah, there's a little place just down the road from where we're recording this it's called John's Pass. And if there's some local listeners, they'd be familiar with it. And... Uh, we gather right just outside the boardwalk. Had 550 people packed out there. Some of them were back in the street, and we had an outdoor service, and it was beautiful. I almost went, but then I realized that would require me waking up before nine o'clock, and I also remembered that you were going to be there, so I didn't end up going. <laughs> and I didn't go because, as an intern at Seminole, I was needed to help set up banners before Ooh, church, an intern. and I was told to be there at 8:30, and so I get there. Uh, about like you know three or four minutes afterwards after 8 30 and all the banners were set up i'm like dang it that was a really fun story <laughs> yeah, so we, we, and we're gathering here on a wednesday night you know after our respective church services we're all coming from different churches tonight but we're here now um y'all i posted something on facebook to try and get some feedback and, uh, man, I think we have the rest of the year scheduled out. There's Honestly, so many topics. Yeah, we got stuff sent um, to our Facebook, our email. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and keep it up. Theology Thursday Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> um, you can send us questions or topics you want us to cover. Um, we love that kind of interaction. That's what it's all about. Um, and we appreciate those who responded. But before we start, I want to introduce a new segment um, called Subpoints. And this is just kind of a, a time where we'll we'll gather and we'll share. Maybe we'll talk about a movie we saw recently, or a book we've read, or or a current event in news or media or whatever. We're just it could be anything, but it's just going to be a brief little topic uh, that's that's relevant for us to talk about real quick before we go into our main topic for the week. So next sub point. <laughs> Uh, has to do with a band called King's Kaleidoscope. This is an alternative Christian rock band. Um, and recently, 
just last year they came out with a new album called The Beauty Between and I, I heard, one of their songs came up on my recommended on Spotify I listened to it and it's awesome the song's called Sticks and Stones and it's super catchy and fun and I've been listening to it a lot lately and so I went in to do a little more research about this band um, well first of all this recent album 2017 had a bunch of collaborations people like Andy Minio Propaganda other really prominent Christian artists that got involved um so you have a lot of people endorsing their work by associating with them in that way. To me, to do a song with somebody is to endorse them. Um, and then I start going back, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. I wonder if they have any other good songs. And I start going back and kind of backtracking, and I go on an album the year before, an album that came out in 2016, uh, and they have a song on that album called A Prayer, and I noticed it had the explicit tag next to it. Which I, which was just surprised me, because I'm looking and I'm like, oh, Andy Minio propaganda, all these people collaborating, and then another album that's like modern versions of hymns they have like in Christ Alone and and um, Come Thou Fount and like all these great hymns, and then they have this song called A Prayer, and yeah. then underneath it says explicit. Now that I think of it, I actually I have listened to that song. You heathen. A prayer. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. Prayer. And it just it surprised me. Um. Now, in interviews, he's um, defending himself. Well, uh, to clarify, there are two completely unfiltered F-words just uttered in the chorus of this song. Yeah, they dropped the F-bombs. Um, so this isn't just like any cuss word. Like they're just the granddaddy of all cuss words right there. In the middle of a Christian album that it just didn't fit like the rest of the songs on the album. It kind of comes out of nowhere. Now, in defense, um, the writer of the song has talked about the fact that the song is what the title says it is. It's a prayer, and it's something that came from a very honest place in his life. At that time, he was um, really struggling, and he kind of cries out to God, and he was hurting. And these were kind of the words and thoughts that were forming in his head. And um, that he was kind of surprised and disappointed by some of the backlash because, you know, it took him a while to get to a place where he could actually put this really honest, raw, intimate moment into a song and put that out there for people. That being said, okay, f my take on this, so, I mean, I guess the question is, is it okay for there to be cussing in, you know, quote-unquote Christian songs? And I, I hear where he's coming from. I understand, okay... If you are really struggling and you're depressed, you're struggling with anxiety or whatever, and you're crying out to God, and it's this moment that you're at rock bottom, really distraught, uh, you might end up saying the F word, right? You might end up cussing, and that doesn't make you like an evil person, right? I mean, if you're, you're in a low moment, those words do come out, right, for a lot of people. Not everybody expresses them that self, themselves that way, but some people do. So if he was struggling and he was praying and that happened, that's one thing. But there's no way he didn't know that this was going to cause a lot of controversy. For them oh, yeah. as a band who had already released yeah. a couple of worship albums to just drop this on one of their songs in the middle of a worship album, he knew that was going to cause a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion. And it just, it's hard to feel like, oh, he was just doing that because he was being honest. Because honestly, there's a there's a radio edit of the song without the F word in it, and it's just as powerful. Mm -hmm. To me, the F word actually distracts, and that's not because I'm saying, oh, you know, it's he's evil for having ever you know thought about cussing or whatever. No, it's just in this setting, right, a worship album. It seems it's hard for it not to look like he's just doing it for attention. Yeah. Um, and it's something that, you know, Paul talked about us not causing others to stumble, right? It was something that, um, I don't know, I feel like the song works without it, it's effective without it, and I think it kind of comes from a place of immaturity to put it on there when you know it's going to be a stumbling block for people, and when you know it's going to cause a lot of controversy, because then it just kind of distracts from your ultimate mission. Now, that's just my take on it. Um, Andy Minio, one of the people who collaborated with him on his new album, has gone to Twitter before talking about how you know people need to, to calm down about cussing and it's not that big a deal. 
So some of these Christian artists that have continued to collaborate with them and endorse them, even though they might not cuss in their music, have had you know controversial views on the topic as well. But uh, so, what are your guys' thoughts on this? Yeah, I I basically agree with you. I think that the big thing that you said is that it's going to be a stumbling block to other people. And he knew full well what he was doing. He was not naive and putting it in there and thinking, oh, everybody's going to love it. No, there's going to be major backlash. And so I don't think, yeah, I don't think it was very edifying. I don't think it should have been, I don't think it was very appropriate. Um, now, as far as the other Christian rappers defending him, uh, defending uh, that band, um, I could kind of see what they're saying. Uh, cussing is not the, the one. Of, it's not a mortal sin. It's, even though we don't really believe in mortal sins like the Catholics do, uh, it's not going to, because you cuss, that doesn't mean you're not a Christian. You can't lose your salvation for cussing. It's not the, the worst thing you could ever do. It's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but cussing does not edify, and I just don't think it's very appropriate in that context. I, f I feel like no matter where you stand on it, to be in the position he's in as a worship artist, um, that it was just stirring up foolish controversy. Yeah, and you know, here at Theology Thursday, we're all about... We are all about foolish controversy, but I think it's in the right context. Yeah, foolish controversy is our favorite. Yeah, I just had to throw that in there. So, Johnny, bring some foolish controversy. No, I mean, Paul said that everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. So, he needs to be asking the question, is this beneficial for my listeners? Um, and I think it is kind of ironic that the song is titled A Prayer and that it is a prayer. Some of our prayers, and you alluded to this, are, are very private you know before the yeah. lord and um you know david has a lot of psalms that are published in the word of god but i'm sure that there were i mean david had his own prayer times with the lord you know the, the bible even talks about the fact that he had these these times with the lord and i'm sure there are things that david said to the lord that we don't read about in the bible because it's not relevant or helpful to us it was a very private conversation between him and his maker so um, I think, too, he has to ask himself how much of that is private, you know, that, that kind of raw, honest part of it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. may have just needed to stay between him and God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's let's move into our main topic for the week. This wow. comes from You're skipping my sub. Point. Oh, yeah, that's right. You had a sub point. I'm sorry. OK, you see, Connor just not does not recognize the authority of the host of the podcast, who is Ryan Mock, and I'm just offended. So, I don't have a sub point. So. <laughs> okay, so my sub point is I just finished reading a book by R.C. Sproul. The book title is Chosen by God. It is R.C. Sproul's, one of R.C. Sproul's most famous books, right up there with The Holiness of God, which I also recommend. Um, and many people who are Calvinists today uh, point to that book Chosen by God is one of the, the defining points in their journey to Calvinism. Um, the Chosen by God is basically about the biblical concept of predestination, that God elects people to salvation. And uh, the way that R.C. Sproul just puts it is, is it's simple yet effective. Uh, a lot of people are afraid, I think, of talking about that kind of stuff. Oh, well, we're not going to talk about predestination because it divides people and it's just not important. Um, but I think we can talk about it in an, effect, in an effective manner, and I think it's also incredibly important because it has to do with our salvation and, and how salvation works in, in, in a believer, and it points to the sovereignty of God. And there's also implications to the, our views of predestination. So I think R.C. Sproul lays it out very simply and easy to understand. A lot of people are afraid that that kind of stuff will be confusing, um, and hard to understand, but the, I, I just think the way R.C. Sproul writes is very easy to understand, and so that's why I would recommend this book if you want uh, a nice, concise, easy-to-understand book on predestination. So yeah, 10 out of 10, thumbs up. Thank you for the, the recommendation, Ryan. I, I love our R.C. Sproul, and uh, that, is, that is a good book that you just mentioned. Yeah. Four thumbs up. Ryan, I mean, uh, you're not right. Johnny, have, Did, you, ever, have could, you ever read Chosen by God? Yeah, could Johnny I, ha I can't it? recommend this book. I have read The Holiness of God, and I do love that book, and I love R.C. Sproul. Okay, so you can recommend R.C. Sproul. 
overall, yes. So can you just go ahead and give a thumbs up just to make me sure. feel better? Of course. All right, I'll give that it is two. one, two, I love him. three, four. By the way, you can't see it right now, but it was. Uh, uh, All right, mm-hmm. one, two, three, four, five, six, six out of six thumbs up. Uh, I wish you guys could see this right now. It's a really powerful moment. Um, so our main topic comes from a listener named Katie. Hi, Katie. Uh, hi, Katie. Um, and it is about a thing called baptism, and uh, specifically. Uh, the differences between the Protestant and Catholic view on baptism, which we'll kind of get into. Um, And at the very end, once we've kind of talked about the theology and and everything in baptism for a little bit, uh, we're going to address a very specific question from her that I think is a really great question. Um, For the most part, I'm going to let you guys kind of lead this conversation because the thing I really wanted to address was this question at the end because I have a personal story that I think kind of ties right into what she's asking about um so in the meantime johnny i know you wanted to kind of introduce and talk about why baptism why is it a thing yeah i was actually recently studying this um at part of partly a personal study partly for my uh, academic studies in bible school and made some cool discoveries about the fact that um, baptism really originates from um this pattern in the biblical narrative that's repeated over and over again um, it, and it goes back to page one of the Bible. Uh, if you look at the beginning, it talks about the fact that um, there was this kind of chaotic void, that God's Spirit existed above the waters, and God took this, and, the, and he separated the waters and the dry land, and out of this watery chaos, he formed what we know um, to be uh, the world today. And then um, the flood, um, Noah and the flood, we know this story, took watery chaos and hit the reset button on the planet and gave them a second chance. Yeah, and, and Peter even relates the story of Noah's Ark to baptism in First Peter. Right, and, and many Jewish people would because they recognize this pattern in the biblical narrative. It continues in Exodus where they pass through a watery chaos once again into the promise of a new life. Um, Joshua at the Jordan, they pass through a watery chaos into the promise of a new life. And so Jesus' baptism really sets the example that um, this is something we should do. And Isaiah is kind of the last prophecy explaining this. And um, basically the nations in our imperfect world is compared to raging waters. And Jesus is proclaimed as the king that's going to come and uh, bring order um, to this in the new um, creation. So um, it would have been really important to the Jewish people when John introduced, John the Baptist introduced baptism to people, they would have totally understood it and been like, yes, this is, this is a, a symbol of newness of life. And now this is like the final thing, like, like we're, the Messiah is here. We're, we're, this represents um, kind of the finality of walking into newness of life once and for all. Very interesting. Uh, so, if you look at different denominations and branches of Christianity, you'll see that people have different views on baptism. Wait a minute. Christians have different views on things? Um, yes, they do. Oh, wow. Uh, and sometimes people view that as foolish controversy. Um, I'm under the conviction that baptism is incredibly important uh, because Jesus talks about it and baptism seems to be so closely tied to salvation that obviously the new testament writers see significance in baptism so i think it's important to get baptism right absolutely Um, okay so i think and i don't want to jump the gun because we're going to get more at how the question relates to our life but obviously there are different views on whether baptism is like actually tied um, to salvation, mm. you know, and so Mark mm. sixteen sixteen. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Okay, so Mark sixteen sixteen says, "Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved." Now, that first part of the verse, you think, okay, both. You need both, right, to be saved. But it's interesting that Mark specifically follows it up with, "But whoever does not believe will be condemned." He doesn't mention baptism. The failure to, to be baptized is not the thing that makes you condemned. It's failure to believe. Right. That's the thing that he emphasizes. And in Acts 22, 16, um, he says, and uh, now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. 
And again, that's an unfortunate uh, translation uh, because you can read that both ways in English. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. You could think that the baptism is washing away your sins, or he could be talking about both as separate thoughts. And a lot of thought for thought translations have taken that and separated it because of the Greek. And it, it really reads, rise and be baptized, period. Wash away your sins by calling upon his name. Mm. So um, if you actually go back and read it in Greek, um, that's actually more um, accurate. So they're two separate thoughts. Still both very important, but only one's emphasized as the means of your salvation. And, and just a side point, going back to Mark 16, 16, that verse is actually part of a passage that is, that is uh, debated among scholars as to whether that's actually in the book of Mark. Uh, early, earliest mans manuscripts uh, say that Mark ends verse 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 8, and then everything after that is uh, added in in a later manuscript. And there's debate about that, but I just think that maybe that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at that specific verse. Just throwing that out there. But yeah, we don't believe that baptism is essential for salvation. Um, we do believe that baptism is significant, and so I think uh, it's a discussion we need to have. Uh, so let's talk about different denominations, what their views are on baptism. You want me to kind of go through the outline we have here? Yeah, sure. Okay. So... <clears throat> Uh, we kind of asked about the difference between, uh, Katie asked about the difference between like Protestant and Catholic views on baptism. We're going to kind of break down uh, more, uh, that's pretty broad, you know, Protestant, there's a lot of different. Yeah, within Protestantism, there are different views on baptism, and if we look at the Lutherans, we'll definitely see there's a difference between their view and our view. So we're going to break it uh, down a little bit more. Um, so Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox believe you must be baptized to receive justification. Um, the same way and, and that they believe uh, many of the sacraments are must, are requirements for salvation. Yeah. Uh, baptism would not be the only one they say this about, and I think that's one of the problems with Catholicism. Yeah. If you're a Catholic listener, we love you, but we're also going to state our views. Right. Uh, well, not... Not our views. I mean, sometimes we're going to talk about things where, you know, it's kind of up to interpretation, but there are other things where the Bible is very clear. And uh, there is no sacrament that that helps us be more saved, right? Right. And so that's kind of the major major difference there. Yeah. The, uh, the Roman Catholics, they, they have this phrase to describe the work of baptism. It's a Latin phrase, and so if I, if I say this, I'm probably going to butcher it, but it's ex opere operato I think that's how you pronounce it basically what that phrase means is that the the efficiency or the the effects of baptism are transmitted in the actual work of baptism not on the subjective uh, belief of the person who receives it and basically what this means is that faith is not efficient to save somebody um, it is actually the work of baptism that uh, completes that and saves that person and it is merely the work. And so what I mean by this is that somebody who does not believe in God or Jesus and is baptized, that person could be saved. And they also apply that to infants. Uh, Roman Catholics baptize infants. And they believe that if you baptize an infant, uh, even though that infant cannot believe because of just cognitive ability or whatnot, uh, that infant will be saved. Yes, which I'm glad you brought that up because infant baptism is something that I knew would come up in this conversation. Um, yes, we will talk about infant baptism. We'll get a, that to a little bit more when we come around to the Presbyterians, I think. Yeah, uh, okay. my homeboys. Yeah, your homeboys. So um, the Episcopalian and Anglican churches have a similar view on baptism, that they see it as the time when one, and this is how the, the Book of Common Prayer, which is, is something they both use for their liturgy, describes it, uh, Baptism is the time when one renounces their sin, confesses their faith, and receives forgiveness. Essentially, they see it as more of a spiritual occurrence mm -hmm. that happens to the believer rather than like a physical thing that they do. Yeah, and I know that for our Anglican friends, um, I read the uh, the thirty nine articles of, of religion. That's that's um, Anglican 
uh, an Anglican confession, basically, or statement of beliefs. And the way they put it, when I read it, is kind of vague. Like, I'm not really sure what they're trying to say. Yeah. And I think the reason why they make it vague in the 39 articles is to cover a wide beliefs, a wide range of beliefs on baptism. So in the Anglican tradition, you'll find people who do believe in baptismal regeneration, uh, which means that you must be baptized to be saved, and you'll find people who don't believe that. So just keep that in mind when you're talking to an Anglican about that topic. Now, not everybody believes in the Anglican tradition that baptism is required. So, I described it as, as baptism is the time when one renounces sin, confesses faith, and receives forgiveness. And Lutherans, to, an ex to a certain extent, would agree with it, but they take it a step further by emphasizing the fact that baptism is an act of God yeah. through human hands. And if God is not involved, then it's meaningless. Yeah. So... Uh, and then that distinguishes it from the Roman Catholic view, which just says, if you get baptized, then you will receive that grace. But for a Lutheran, uh, in order for that baptism to have any meaning, the person who receives a baptism must have faith. Otherwise, it is not a work of God. It is just a work of man that has no meaning. So that is what distinguishes the Lutheran view from the Roman Catholic view. You must have faith along with that baptism. Good job. Do you got any other views? Of course I do. So, the Church of Christ, kind of the Pentecostal movement, all our charismatic friends... Um, we love you too. ...believe that you should baptize the snakes that you handle. Um, I'm sorry, I had, <laughs> I had to make a snake. Sorry if he offended you, charismatics. It's, um, a foolish controversy in the day. <laughs> um, no, they believe that repentance is insufficient without baptism. So that repentance of sin is insufficient without baptism. So essentially coming back to uh, baptism is essential for salvation. Right. And so when I was when I was actually studying all this, I was surprised by how many different denominations in Protestant theology that in the Protestant branch that actually do believe that you yeah. need baptism to be saved. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of threw me off. Um, because to say Pentecostal... You know, Church of Christ would be the main one, but that even covers a pretty wide spectrum it does. of denominations. And I think along with uh, the Anglicans, I think that you're going to find people in the charismatic movement who do not believe that baptism is required for salvation. So, Methodist and Baptist um, do agree on one thing, finally. Um, I'm sorry, that was a joke. You guys need to laugh when I make a joke. So <laughs> that is a, a joke. We need to add a laugh We love track, all our so friends. We don't laugh. You could just... <laughs> we yeah. love the Methodists. We're ecumenical. Sorry, go ahead. This is awkward. Um, <laughs> that baptism is a symbolic public proclamation of our salvation. Something mm. that happens after salvation. Sounds more like the Bible. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically. Well, I mean, that's because it's the Baptist view. I mean, look, I am a Baptist, so baptism is obviously important to me. This episode makes me happy because I'm Baptist. And, you know, John was a Baptist, Paul was a Baptist, <laughs> Jesus was a Baptist. Oh, uh, gosh. It's the way to go. Um, so, baptism is a symbolic public proclamation of our salvation. And um, generally speaking, that's the Reformed view on it, too. Well, hold on there. Let me let let me talk about that. I was but yeah, I was about to hand it over to you because they they do some baby sprinkling, some infant baptism. They, they within the reformed view, there's some different. Yeah, if you thought the charismatics that. were weird, just wait till you yeah, hear okay. Ryan well, so Ryan's a freak. <laughs> so as I I think I've said this on the podcast before, but I am a closet Presbyterian. Not anymore. And honestly, I'm coming out of the closet. <laughs> Well, you already did that on another episode, so okay. you can't use that phrase. <laughs> okay, so, well, this is... Yeah, the get... next time you got to say, I am an out-of-the-closet Presbyterian. All right, I was in the closet, but I've burst forth in glorious day. We have 13 listeners now, man. You're, you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not safe. <laughs> so, um, what separates the Baptist view of baptism from the Reformed view of baptism is that Baptists believe that baptism is an ordinance, while the Reformed view believes that baptism is a sacrament. Um, now, when we think of sacraments, we get a little bit afraid because we think of the Roman Catholics and their view of the sacraments, and they're like, oh, you gotta, 
uh, perform the sacraments in order to, to have to uh, receive grace, um, sa uh, grace that saves. Uh, but that is not the Reformed view of sacraments. Um, uh, the Reformed, just like the Baptists, believe that the Lord Jesus, he instituted two sacraments or ordinances, um, the Lord's Supper, which is communion, and baptism. And so while the Baptists believe that uh, baptism is an ordinance, which basically means it's something that we have to do in obedience, basically. Um, the, the Reformed believe that it's a sacrament in, in, the, in the sense that it actually confers grace to the believer who, who receives that baptism. And it's not grace that saves. Um, when we use the word sacrament in Reformed theology, we mean it in a more mysterious way. Like, I know this is, this is going to get a little mystical for all of you Baptist listeners out there. I'm but, already uncomfortable. Yeah, Connor is sweating, <laughs> and Johnny is shaking his head in, in no, disappointment. No, I, mean, I, I work in the interdenominational church. That's true. So, yeah, yeah, I'm really whatever good. That yeah. means. Um, <laughs> whatever that means. Grace is conferred to the believer who gets baptized in a mysterious way. It is not a grace that saves the person, but it is more of a grace that strengthens your faith and confirms the faith that you have in Jesus. Um, the Reformed uh, people they see baptism and the preaching of the word, they see that going hand in hand. Um, wait, hold on. So when you say you're a closet Presbyterian, like, like all that actually sounds like really good. Like I think you could apply that, you know, potentially to the Baptist view, but then where does the sprinkling babies come in? Or am I jumping the gun? Okay, yeah, you're jumping the gun. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Please complete. So yeah, there, there's, a, there's a connection between baptism and the preaching of the word. Um, and baptism is when you when you hear the word that is uh, uh you audibly hear the word but baptism is the visible word the the visible word uh which confirms what is preached and um and it is something that the believer experiences about the the word that is preached um so it points to stuff that is preached from the word the gospel and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and baptism uh, reflects that and uh and so yeah, when we say sacrament and how grace is conferred to the believer, it's it's pretty mysterious. And so I can't really say much more about that. The other thing about baptism from a Reformed perspective is not only is it sacramental, but it's also covenantal. Um, so we view baptism as a, a manner in which God speaks to his people. Um, when we look at the whole realm of Scripture, uh, we see that God communicates to people via covenants, right? Oh, yeah. Um, there's the covenant of works, which is the one that uh, God makes with Adam. You know, if you, if, you, if you don't eat from the tree, then you'll be fine. If you do, then you'll have death, which is not good. Uh, that's the covenant of works. And then after that, right after the fall, uh, God institutes the covenant of grace. And you see that in Genesis well, chapter 17. At Adam, how long? It's gonna be a long episode. No, <laughs> no. it's fine. It's well, not that many. I, mean, I, was, I think he's totally. We should have a whole podcast on covenants because yeah. it's kind of yeah. Covenant really theology will have to uh, do a whole episode, but it's important to understand covenant theology when you talk about baptism. Yeah, I was joking. Continue. Okay. Well, for our listeners, I was yeah, I was joking. I'm just saying, like, I, I have so many things to say about what you're saying, but we don't have time. Today. Right. Yeah. But, we can, we yeah. can do a whole different discussion <laughs> yeah. on that. Um, the the covenant of grace uh, includes everything in the Old Testament besides pre-fall and the New Testament. So the believers, the Old Testament saints, are under that same covenant that we are under. Um, and so we see parallels between uh, the, the Old Testament saints and the administration of, of God's covenant to those people. And we see a parallel between that and the uh, administration of, of God's covenant to the New Testament believers. And the thing with baptism is that we see the parallel between baptism and circumcision. Um, we believe that... He just did that, guys. He just brought circumcision into I'm this. I'm going to have to bleep that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's part of it. Uh, it's scriptural. It's biblical. Yeah, that, there's and a so lot of things. And so what circumcision does is it initiates... Okay, whoa. <laughs> We're still talking about circumcision. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be mature about it. Go, go ahead. Um, uh, circumcision... No, that I will. Circumcision initiates uh, an infant into the visible covenant community 
Um, and there's a distinction between the... Okay, my voice is cracked. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm just <laughs> thinking, okay. even if he's not Jewish? Um, are we, you're talking about, like, ancient Israelites, Yeah, we're right? talking about the Old Testament. Okay, good. Circumcision initiates the, tr- the infant into the covenant community. Okay. Back up. What God. is circumcision? <laughs> so, so I'm starting to see the comparison here. The idea is is that circumcision entered you into the spiritual yeah. community of faith. Well, uh, and, it, and it's it, it's the visible church sure. of the Old Testament. It's not the invisible. Israel. Baptism is the new circumcision. Exactly. Right, under the new covenant. It's so that snip snip. The old snip snip, and that is what you do. And that's that's why uh, Reformed people baptize infants. Uh, that is one of the reasons. I think there's more to it, but that will take up a lot more time that we don't have. Do you think you want to baptize your future infant? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Do you think that baptizing your future infant guarantees their salvation? Absolutely not. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. And some people do believe that it, it guarantees their salvation. What we, what Reformed people believe is that we baptize infants because we expect them to enter into the invisible uh, church, uh, not the visible church. And uh, just because when you are in a Christian environment your whole life, that's something that you may, uh, most likely, you'll also follow along with that. Now, that's not everybody. Um, I know people who are not like that, who grew up Christians, and now they're not. And so that's why I would believe that infant baptism does not save the, the infant. It just initiates the infant into the community, the visible community. For the record, we sprinkle and dunk at our church, so if you ever need to sprinkle... We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't dunk babies. That would not be good. Yeah, that's not a good idea. And they allow you to have coffee in the sanctuary. Yep. So it's it's all around a win-win, uh, except for that darn parking lot. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, we're going to quote for quote from, from Katie's email. Uh, something. I, this is a question that I feel like we've already answered, but I really want to hit home on this at the end and emphasize this because... We talked a lot of different the different views on it and, and you know get into kind of the, the meat of it. But here's the application, right? Because the, the ultimate purpose of her point, I think we've made our, our stance clear on it. How do you respond when someone close to you believes that baptism is essential to, th- to their salvation and that it takes away all of their original sin? That was Katie's question, right? And uh, I just want to share a quick story. Uh, I had a kid in children's church that was just, she was she was absolutely horrible. I mean, just causing issues every week and, and, and all over the place. And then one week, she comes to know Christ. And there is this obvious transformation in her life. I mean, it's a totally different kid, night and day. She comes to me a few weeks later in tears because her parents, who are not Christians, are not going to let her get baptized. And she says, I'm not going to be able to go to heaven. If I die, I'm not going to be able to go to heaven because they won't let me get baptized. And then Connor pulled out a water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I, you, you really ruined what I was building up to. I'm sorry. But I... And and so I come back to this story because I have a I had a friend who who once uh, had the view that salvation uh, that baptism was essential to salvation, and um, they were telling me this, and so I, I shared with them this story about this student. I said, "What was I supposed to tell her? Do you really think that I I should have told her? Yeah, after seeing the life transformation that God only God could do in her, I was supposed to sit there and answer her." Uh, yeah, we better talk to your parents because if you die today, you're going to hell. No, I knew she was saved. The evidence was there in her life. And her parents, if they refused to let her get baptized, that's something that she wasn't going to be able to do until she was 18. She was 10 at the time. Uh, Got eight years to not die. Yeah, we're not promised tomorrow. So if she died between, you know, being a child and finally being an adult and having the decision to be baptized, she's still going to heaven mm-hmm. because she got saved and it was a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's important. And um, you know, aspects of theology like this may not seem important until you get a question like that. Uh-huh. Then it hits you. Yeah, right. Uh, and to affirm, you know, your thoughts on that from the Bible, Luke three sixteen. 
when John talks to them about baptism, he says, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And um, that but is very important because he is saying, this is part of it, but it's not the thing. It's not the thing that saves you. And so you seeing the Holy Spirit in this little girl showed that she had received um, a, a baptism greater than just, you know, being dunked or, or sprinkled. Not that that's not important, but just that that's not the, the defining moment uh, marker of salvation. And I thought a lot about Katie's question. I think if somebody was wrestling with this idea, the first thing I would say is, you know, I have a lot of questions. I want to understand your view. I think it's important that we approach those people in love, generally wanting to know why they've arrived at that conclusion. And I would ask questions like, uh, you know, why did Jesus die in your view? Why didn't he just come and teach us how to be baptized, you know, and how, how, to, how to do that? Wow, that's sassy. Um, no, I, I, <laughs> no I, I, but, but that's why I said I think I would start with, I really want to understand you. I'm asking these questions because I care about you and I want to get you. Right, and you should do that in any kind of Amen. Uh, conversation that mm-hmm. you are engaging in with somebody else who has an opposing viewpoint. Unless mm-hmm. they're a Methodist. Unless they're a Methodist. The Bible <laughs> says uh, to give a defense of the faith with the gentleness. Wow. <laughs> and keep going. Uh, you're supposed to give a defense of the faith with gentleness and respect, and that could refer to apologetics, but I think that, that uh, has to do with any kind of conversation that we're having with unbelievers or people who just have varying viewpoints and i also think that um framing baptism as a symbol that's brought about by the pattern that i discussed at the beginning this pattern in the biblical narrative of passing through death into new life um as as a symbol is is important too because um I, i just think it's important to know where it came from because um you know the roman catholic view is is very new Whereas this is an ancient, um, this is an ancient thing um, that goes all the way back to page one of the Bible. So, I would just like to add as a sub point is that I don't I don't think it's wise to to pull straw man arguments when we're discussing this. Um, so make sure you represent your people correctly. I would say like for example, the Roman Catholics also believe that. You could be saved without getting baptized, but it is on the uh, the condition that you have been baptized by blood, which means you were mar- you were martyred for your faith before you were able to get baptized, or you had a baptism of desire, which means you desire to be baptized, but something is preventing you from doing so. And so, these other denominations they do have. Uh, answers for those kinds of questions so I think it's important not to misrepresent them sure uh, and that's why it's important to to ask questions to your, to right. your people you're disagreeing with like why do you say this uh, what assumptions are you making uh, teach me what you believe right and I'll explore this so right absolutely 100% yeah and and that's I mean that's the whole point of this show really is 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 look Christians have different views on a lot of different things and we're here to talk about it and yeah, so, we're all about foolish controversy. But it's, yeah, it's all about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the thing is, Ryan and I both work with non-denominal, n- n- non-denominal, non-denominational ministries, and Johnny's a youth pastor at an interdenominational church. Yeah, uh, we're all about working with Christians who have different views than us. Um, but we're going to talk about it, and we're going to present every view. We want to talk about it from every angle. Uh, we're also going to share ours, but that doesn't mean like we're like putting anybody down, right? We and besides the Methodists, yeah, besides the Methodists. <laughs> if if we agree on the essentials of the faith, we're good. I believe that Roman Catholics can be saved if they if they put their trust in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, there's a big difference between us and them, but I'm still willing to uh, accept that person as a member of the invisible church yeah and i think one thing i've learned and i I worked uh primarily with the roman catholic church when i was doing mission work in ireland but i've also learned that there's a lot of things that we can learn from other denominations that maybe we we've kind of put ourselves in boxes within our denomination and we you know and, and, and one example in catholicism is even though a lot of 
things you know might be considered or you could make the argument are extra biblical they do have a very participatory uh um, style of worship that mm-hmm. i think we could do well to learn from a lot of times we come in and we just stand there and um the bible is very clear that you know um we we're our physical body is a very important part of who we are you know and so to engage that when we're in worship the fact that you know there's a lot of participation and responsive reading and things like that um to where you're actually engaged in worship is a really really cool thing that the the catholics bring and that that can be applied to baptism too is that we're actually participating physically in this thing um, that god's doing in our hearts yeah so we so here at theology thursday we're all about one foolish controversy but two unity in christ and a universal church absolutely so uh, after some of the jokes i mean I, I do just need this disclaimer out there we love methodist we love methodist as much as we love foolish controversy yes we really do and parking lots with coffee dispensers i don't think you understand what our church does <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean... <laughs> we have a bad parking lot, great coffee dispensers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's separate. It's totally separate. But at least you combine the two. You think if we put coffee dispensers in the parking lot, that would solve the parking lot issue? Well, not that it would at solve the parking lot issue. At least it would distract issue. people from the well, yeah, fact that it's... they are stuck. <laughs> <laughs> they are stuck until John and Sue pick up their kid from the preschool. <laughs> Sunday is race day. I didn't even mean, I didn't realize <laughs> John and Sue, that's... Yeah, you kind of just paraphrase my wife and I's name, but... Well, they're, they're just such generic names. <laughs> you heard sorry. it right here in the podcast. We're generic. <laughs> so that's what we're about here at the We're garden the variety not, people. You, it's not a Methodist church. They, you might have some Methodists because it's interdenominational. We do. Yeah, that's the Methodist. Do you? Yeah. We have a lot of uh, Catholics and recovering Catholics and... It's it's quite a mixed match, mm, that's and scary. we really need we need to talk about. I'm uh, when you start talking about covenants, I just my uh, I'm really into Old Testament stuff. Hmm. That's kind of my dream for the mm-hmm. future is to teach Old Testament <laughs> stuff. So you talk, start talking about covenants, and I'm like, I gotta, gotta uh, we need to talk about <laughs> covenants. What that is, but um, well, this has been fun. Look, we got some some really exciting uh, things going on behind the scenes. I've been networking. I've been doing lots of. Uh, Ryan, please don't eat your cell phone. Uh, <laughs> and this is why I do the networking and not Ryan. But I'm the host, so. But he's the host. So, uh, yeah, just stay in touch with us uh, and feel free to interact. Um, Theology T Pod, that's our Twitter handle. That's right. Check it out. <laughs> we're on Instagram now, too. Hey. Um, and we're on YouTube. We're finally on YouTube. We have not... Uh, Onslaught Talk Official, where this kind of came from, the idea came from a long time ago, we actually have our own Theology Thursday YouTube channel now, and our episodes go up on there. And iTunes and Spotify, it's coming. I promise it's coming. Just be patient. And uh, I I guess that's all. You guys have a fantastic week. A Theology Thursday-filled week. But Thursday's only one day of the week. I'm not talking about Thursday. I'm talking about the full week. Okay, well, we'll see you next Thursday. Yep.